Klein says, but... Well, I mean, I don't know that I actually reflected too much on the boat. Right. But he has a whole section on it. That's right, boat. yeah. It's yeah. right in there. Yeah. But I just don't see it. I don't see that as a... I see that as a, if it happens, it happens. Like, there is, it's, not, it's not the emphasis. The emphasis is the calling out of from the dark. All right, it's uh, time for our 20-minute break to stop. We don't see it in the glorification of the culture. It's in the resurrection. All right, uh, let's uh, move on now from chapter 2 to chapter uh, 7. Chapter 2 has uh, already, I think, demonstrated the basic point about <clears throat> eschatological pattern in that it uh, shows that the kingdom of God doesn't come that, uh, as kingdom of power and glory. The stone doesn't become a cosmic mountain until and, and after it has uh, put an end to the world kingdom uh, totally and pulverized it. And as I say, the premillennial scheme it wouldn't fit into that, and uh, and it's also discouraging to the optimism of the, the postmillennial view as well. Well, now the same same points are uh, established by the vision of uh, Daniel seven of the four beasts, and uh, e even more vividly so. Maybe it, just before looking at. Uh, that we could uh, describe the critical view, the messianic uh, view, and the dispensationalist view of what's going on here with the, the fourth beast through the ten horns, and uh, then the little horn, and then the figure of the Son of Man, just uh, quickly setting up the possibilities or, uh, that you'll find. Um, so we'll deal first with the fourth kingdom. And. Um, the, the beast itself, huh? <coughs> and then there are the ten horns, and after them that comes up an eleventh one, the, the uh, little horn, and then of course there's the figure of the of the Baranash, the Baranash, the son of man figure. And uh, first, let's note the uh, critical views. Remember, we did something like this for the uh, 70 weeks passage. Uh, and you know how the, the critics are, are, are bent on ending everything in the book of Daniel by the second century BC. And uh, so they're, they're going to be doing the same thing here. That, that's the beast, <coughs> ten horns, the little horn, and the son of man. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what would the fourth kingdom be on the critical view? Which kingdom? Greece. Greece. Okay. Well, of course, that's uh, their understanding of that because they have divided the second one in, in, into the Medes two and then the Persians three. That brings you to, to, to Greece as the fourth one, and Rome isn't in the picture at all anymore, of course. Then, And, and now on that basis, the, the ten horns... Uh, would be uh, ten Seleucid kings after the uh, death of Alexander and the breakup of his kingdom into four parts. Uh, then we, in the book of Daniel, we're especially concerned with Syria, where the Seleucids reigned, and, and with Egypt, where the Ptolemies uh, reigned. And in their interpretation of this passage, then they are looking uh, to Syria and, and to a, a succession of, of uh, Seleucid kings. And what they try to make out there, well, the little horn, of course, for them is going to be Antiochus Epiphanes, all right? So the great persecutor of the Jews, about 171 to 165 B.C., the disruption of the temple, and then the Maccabean restoration of things, about 171 to 165. That's Antiochus Epiphanes. It's going to be their little horn. And so they try to make out with various gymnastics the, that there were just ten, ten kings uh, leading up to him, and you know you really can't do that. But that's uh, uh, what they suggest. And uh, then, if uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is the little horn, then what is represented by the Baranash, by the the Son of Man figure? And uh, here they have 
oh, a couple of views at least. Uh, one view uh, is then that the one who delivered, of course, from the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes to trouble was one of the Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus, and so uh, and that would be a, a suggestion. And and you, you, we encountered the question once again with the figure of the Son of Man, of individual or corporate, e even for us on our messianic view. Uh, why we, we, we've seen repeatedly how messianic designations can be either either individual or corporate, and then there's a recognition that that's also true in, in these passages. For example, we can speak about the king or the kingdom, that's the individual and it's, it's the, the, the corporate. Well, if, if, you're, if you're going for an individual uh, interpretation and Antiochus is, uh, the, uh, uh, is the, the enemy, well, Judas Maccabeus would be the, the individual if you're going for the corporate one. After all, when you come to the angel's interpretation of the scene where... where uh, the Son of Man receives the, the, the kingdom from the Ancient of Days. When you come to the angel's interpretation, he speaks about the saints possess the, the kingdom. So you have a, a, a corporate dimension to it. And uh, recognizing uh, that, then the suggestion would be that the Jewish nation as a whole, <coughs> uh, the, the people of God as a whole, uh, would be uh, the, the, the Son of uh, Man. Now, however, uh, another distinctive approach to this uh, is to uh, understand uh, this son of man as an angelic figure. And, and this involves the comparison then of what is predicated here in Daniel 7 concerning the son of man and what is uh, attributed uh, in, uh, in Daniel 12 uh, to, to, uh, to Gabriel, Hasa Hagadol, that great uh, prince, as he is called, of, of uh, the nation, in uh, in uh, Daniel 12, and uh, the very similar ro roles, functions, achievements, uh, and and in recognition of that, and uh, that's on the right track in my judgment, to, to see that connection, uh, and, and uh, Gabriel then being a, a, an angel figure, and in terms of the, the critics' understanding, that's all he is, whereas of course. Uh, for myself, going along with, with this connection, I would see, of course, Gabriel as the angel, uh, the messianic angel. But the critical view I'm describing isn't doing that. It's just saying, here, here's one of the angels, uh, Gabriel. And um, if you're looking for an individual fulfillment of it, he's the one. He's the particular angel. If you're looking for a more corporate interpretation, and on this view you see uh, the holy ones of the Most High is a description of angels. It's not a description of human beings at all. And, and so corporately, the, the, these uh, holy ones of the Most High uh, would just be the, the whole company of, uh, of uh, the good angels. So uh, two views, one human, the other angel, each one with either an individual or a, a corporate fulfillment. And with some interesting possibilities actually being recognized by this critical view at this point, although unfortunately not seeing the whole picture and therefore not seeing the, the, the messianic aspect of, of, uh, of the thing. And uh, maybe even before going further with that, just this, uh, what, what would you think of, of that kind of possibility that uh, what is being described here yeah, would be angels? Uh, receiving uh, the, the kingdom rather than, than human uh, beings. And in fact, everything that is predicated here about the Son of Man uh, and, and the saints of the Most High and, and the, the relationship of the little horn as one who is persecuting and prevailing against the saints of the Most High. Um, you, uh, how, how is uh, some uh, earthly uh, figure prevailing in war against uh, the, the, the angels? It would be something you'd have to uh, deal with uh, uh, perhaps uh, the, the biggest problem or certainly a, a major problem for this approach is that the, the outcome of the whole development here, here are the saints suffering and a lot of emphasis, little horn persecuting them time and a time and a half a time and, and uh, that's clearly referring to, to God's people's uh, uh, suffering here and uh, then at last there comes relief and the judgment day comes and uh, the kingdom is given to the angels. Mm -hmm. 
this isn't what the saints want to hear. <laughs> you know, the, the ones, it's, it's time for them to possess the kingdom now. And, and the message tells them that the angels are going to get it. Well, good for the angels, but what, what about that? And it just doesn't uh, answer to the demands of, uh, of the context. But nevertheless, uh, it does have the potential of some interesting connections, messianic, between Mikael and the Baranash. Well, so the second view then would be the messianic view. And here, the fourth beast, of course, is Rome. And if you read the different um, conservatives on this thing, you, you, you at this point could get some variation. Um, I think E.J. Young, as I recall, took the ten horns as a <coughs> the development uh, that uh, we, we come to when we come to the uh, New Covenant age roughly what I was describing as the distinction between uh, stage A and stage B and the fourth uh, uh, B still, uh, although I don't know that Dr. Young is, is making the cutoff point at 70 a, a, AD, but in any case, when you come to the, the new covenant stage of things, so the, the church age, then he says uh, the ten horns represent uh, the world power at that, that stage. So that's one one. Uh, move already from Old Testament, from Rome to to some broader view of things in the church age, and then I think he would understand the, the, the little horn as the crisis at the end of the church age, the uh, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness uh, thing. Uh, I prefer <coughs> I prefer to see the ten horns as part of the situation that you're starting with. It isn't that there is a beast without the ten horns and then there gets ten horns. I, I prefer to see it as the, the, here's a beast with ten horns with, with the, 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 the very wide expansion of the Roman Empire being in, in, in view. And then, as we, we said, I see the little horn as the shift from stage A to stage B that takes place at 78. AD, and, and uh, one primary reason for doing that is precisely the fact that the little horn is described as continuing for the three and a half years, the period which in Daniel 9 describes the whole church age from 70 AD to the end of the age, is in Daniel 7, the period that is attributed to the little horn, which then contradicts the notion that the little horn it, it can be identified just with the Antichrist who is uh, just that final brief crisis and not the whole church age of three and a half times. And so that, uh, that numerical symbol of the three and a half years, I think, is uh, an important one. And I think here it's decisive. And All right, so that's the way it would be. Then with the Son of Man, well, then, of course, we accept that the Son of Man is, uh, is of course, Jesus the Christ. And... Um, but then, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I do agree, as I've already intimated, with the, with the with those who see a connection between the, the Son of Man of Daniel 7 and uh, Mikael, Michael, uh, the figure of, uh, of Daniel 12. So that, that then would be something to, to explore uh, further. But for our present purposes, yes, we agree then that the Son of Man individually is Christ. But then, as we've already noted, when the angel interprets uh, the, the scene of the Son of Man receiving the power, the sovereignty, and the kingdom, it says the saints possessed the kingdom in the closing verses there of, uh, of uh, Daniel 7. And so I, I go along uh, with uh, an individual corporate view on this, just as we had previously on the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the, the Navi figure of Deuteronomy 18. And, and uh, I, for myself, I, I'm the Evid Yahweh figure of the Isaiah songs and, and uh, so on. And uh, so here would be that view. All right, now, dispensationalists. They would agree that the fourth kingdom is Rome. But, of course, here, the, the distinctive thing they do in, with the 70 weeks passage is uh, to, to forcibly in, inject a gap uh, between the 69th and the, the, the 70th week, they're, they're in church parenthesis, they, they do the same thing here in effect. And so you have now a gap 
between the beast and the ten horns. Uh, and uh, that's the whole present church age. Their view, of course, is that the church isn't mentioned in, in, in the Old Testament, and so you couldn't have it at this point either. It, 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 uh, that's, that's the gap. Then what are the ten horns? Well, for them, the ten horns uh, then uh, represent the, the Antichrist uh, stage, uh, the, the, uh, the, the 70th week uh, on their interpretation, which they have separated from the first 69. So after the parenthesis, then comes the 70th week, then comes the, uh, all of the mischief they do with the uh, language of the 70 weeks and taking the work of Christ, confirming the covenant and giving it to the Antichrist as one who makes a covenant and breaks it and brings on the great tribulation and all that. And so the little horn then for, for them is uh, the, the, the Antichrist uh, who uh, enters the scene after the rapture of the church out of the world when, as they see it, God is returning to the old order of things once again and setting that up on the front burner. And, uh, okay. And uh, now the... the, the, the uh, so that's, uh, that they see it in, uh, as the revived Roman Empire. And so that's, uh, you're familiar with that language. Huh? What happens at that time is a reviving of the Roman Empire. And it was because of, of, of that supposed connection that they could identify the coming prince uh, with uh, the Antichrist and, and yet say that, uh, that the Roman legions were an Antichrist army because they think that the Antichrist, what he leads, is a revived Roman Empire. And, and for them, uh, of course, at least they would, they would agree here that the Baranash is Christ. And... Uh, so uh, these, these are the possibilities. And then, of course, with all your pre, post, and, and, and ah variations uh, to be worked in, well, I don't know how the critics will be working that in. They wouldn't be interested in doing it, I guess. Uh, <coughs> but the various ways in which messianic and dispensationalist views could, uh, could work themselves out. Well, that, that's, uh, these are some of the options. Now let's look at Daniel 7, and we've already tried to indicate some of the similarities and some of the differences between the second and seventh uh, visions, and, and we suggested that when you come to the seventh one, uh, uh, what is uh, emphatic is, is uh, the power, and moreover, it's, it's a destructive power. It's, it's the power not to construct. Uh, that, that was Daniel 2. That, that, that was a glorying in, in, in the constructive capabilities of humankind and, and, and kings is to build up great em empires and, and, and so on. Uh, and, and there is wisdom and power needed to do that. But now in Daniel 7, uh, what they glory in is especially the, the power to overcome and to trample under feet and to crush and devour with uh, feet of uh, uh, teeth of iron and, and, and claws of uh, bronze and, and so on. And uh, that's the big emphasis now with the seventh one, the destructive power the destructive uh, power of, uh, of uh, the, the fourth kingdom and uh, exercised uh, among themselves hmm? with each kingdom in, in turn trampling uh, uh, on preceding ones and crushing them, especially when you come to the, uh, the, the fourth one. Uh, but with the, the, the special aspect now that, that, that they, they, they direct this, this crushing and uh, destructive power against God's people. So there is, is the, the hatred of the saints uh, that uh, brings out the more radical religious uh, conflict uh, that we're, we're dealing with uh, with uh, the Antichrist power and, and, and the, the church. Now what we want to bring out quite emphatically is, is the creation dimensions of, of uh, the imagery in, in Daniel uh, 7. Uh, already in Daniel 2 we, we might have outlined things uh, in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of a creation activity, the, the image, huh? The image in, in Daniel 2 was a, a sort of devilish kind of creation. The, the, the agent of the agents of, of, of Satan, these uh, human kings uh, that practice the divine kingship uh, ideology, they were the ones who engaged in this great creation of, uh, of, of this particular image. And then creation is followed by, by D, D-E creation, as, the, as uh, 
the fifth uh, kingdom, the stone strikes the image and, and demolishes it. And then the third uh, feature in the story the line uh, after creation and decreation is re, re creation, where the stone becomes then the great mountain. And, and so here is, is God at uh, work recreatively uh, building a, again his kingdom, which involves, of course, now the elimination of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the world kingdom. Now, that's, that's the way the pagan myths, of course, uh, uh, dealt with the original creation. Uh, the, the, they conceived of the, the original creation as one that involved a conflict of the creator-builder God with, with the enemy and having to overcome them, uh, Baal over against Yam uh, and Mot, uh, Marduk over against um, uh, Tiamat. Uh, the, the, that's the way that the, 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 the myths saw the original creation as a matter of theomachy, battle of of the gods. The Bible doesn't do that huh? with the original creation, but it's precisely that uh, that is the the story of recreation. It, it does involve Christ trampling the head of the serpent, uh, Christ slaying the dragon, and <coughs> in this case the stone striking the, the image uh, and before then uh, the, the cosmic kingdom mountain can be built. Well, that's same story now it is even more fully developed in terms of the imagery of creation in, in Daniel uh, 7. And as we turn to it right away, as Daniel sees the vision, he sees the four great winds of heaven uh, blowing upon uh, the sea. And uh, out of the sea there emerge uh, in, in series then each of the four beasts and, and, and so forth that uh, symbolized the, the kingdom of the beast, the, uh, the kingdom of, of Satan. And I'm sure that you recognize in that uh, the pattern of, of creation, the sea, and with the ruah hovering over and, and, and blowing upon it in order to bring forth uh, the, the creation of, of the Lord. So originally, although there is no conflict uh, with some... A eternal enemy that had to be overcome for God to, to, to proceed. And nevertheless, the, there is the incohate situation of the deep and the darkness that has to be dealt with. There, there is the sea, and it is out of this sort of unpromising situation of the, the waters of the, the turbulent sea that God is going to bring forth the, the cosmic covenantal order of a kingdom which is represented by his image bearer. It will be a kingdom of the Son of Man as uh, Psalm 8 uh, expounds Adam and as the son of man figure and that that's the creational picture in Genesis 1 the, the Ruach of God creatively working over the, the waters of the sea to bring forth a kingdom in the likeness of God not a wild beast uh, but a, a human being uh, the, the image of the glory of God's dominion and moral excellence and, and, and luminosity so the, that's the picture in Genesis 1. And Satan is the pseudo-creator. He, he is the, 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 the false creator who would duplicate God's uh, works. He too would bring forth a, a kingdom uh, out of the waters of the deep representing the, the, the multitudes of the nations of, of uh, mankind. And of course, what he brings forth is going to be something in his own image. And he is the old dragon. And what he brings forth is going to be, therefore, a beast in, in, in his likeness. He produces not a kingdom of the son of man, but a kingdom of the wild beast. And uh, that's what is just about hinted at uh, in, in Daniel 9, the opening verses. And in order then to be more fully uh, aware of it, one has to be sensitive to this whole pattern that we've just been talking about in uh, the, the original creation picked up in the flood, resumed again at the Exodus, and uh, of course uh, expounded rather fully in uh, the book of Revelation in chapter 13, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, but there's that oft-repeated pattern that, that should come to your mind when you, when you read Daniel 9, uh, 7, 1, and 2 uh, of uh, the winds, the four playing again with the idea of the Ruach, the wind, uh, the spirit of God, all the possibilities there. Uh, but the, the wind over the waters, Genesis 1, 2, all over again. And uh, this is what we had in the story of the flood, you all know. 
so that when you have uh, the, the chaotic waters uh, of, of the flood before God can reproduce uh, his uh, kingdom again, the kingdom of the Son of Man, the kingdom of Noah and his family there. there. Uh, Genesis 8 verse 1 tells us once again about the Ruah, huh? Uh, over the waters, and it's from that point on that the waters abate and things move forward constructively uh, to the emergence of, of the kingdom of God from uh, the waters of the flood. And at the Exodus, at the Yom Suf, uh, once again, uh, the, it is the, the, the glory spirit that is leading them and hovering over uh, them, uh, Deuteronomy 30, verse 10, and so on, uh, the, that uh, leads Israel uh, out of the waters, and once again, we uh, confront the, the reproduction of, of, of God's kingdom, the heavenly kingdom in, in Israel, the, the people of God, uh, in, in the tabernacle, the, the, the house of God, and so on. So repeatedly, wind, the ruach, whether wind or spirit, over waters is, is prelude to creation in the image of, of, of the creators. And that's uh, everywhere. And uh, let's turn then to uh, Revelation 13 which uh, picks up rather closely then on Daniel uh, 7. And the division of chapters and so on is uh, some, uh, rather obscures what we're, the point we're trying to make here. But uh, we, <coughs> in our exegesis of Genesis 3.15, took the occasion to... Uh, uh, we worked a little bit through Revelation 12, and we saw Revelation 12 contains a sort of a, a, a double representation of the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman crushing the, the head of the serpent and, and so forth. And uh, that story was told in terms of, of the man-child born of the woman who overcomes uh, the dragon who would swallow him up. and the, the, the Son of Man is caught up to, to heaven and so on. And then the story is told the second time in, in terms of the figure of Michael, and this, of course, would be part of the discussion if we were talking again about the relationship of the Bar and Ash of Daniel 7 and the, and the Mikael of, of uh, and Daniel 12. Uh, what we have here in Revelation 12 would be something you'd want to take account of, where Michael now is the, the parallel figure to the, the man-child who is the Son of Man. Uh, 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 figure, and so the the second time through here in Revelation uh, 12, we we have the story of, of messianic Michael overthrowing the devil and his angels, and so that the devil is thrown out of heaven. He can't get at the individual seed of the woman anymore, but now he can still get at the rest of her seed, is what we uh, read in in Daniel 12 verse 17, and um, he is. Uh, especially concerned now because uh, uh, he, he, he realizes that history is uh, escalating, accelerating toward uh, uh, toward his, uh, final judgment and his, his days are, are, are limited and so he uh, vents his uh, rage all the more and he was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Now there, I don't know what your version does, the NIV I'm looking at here, uh, takes uh, the, this first verse from chapter, what they call chapter 13, and uh, divides it in two, and uh, attaches it to the paragraph which represents chapter 12. So chapter 12 moves along, and then you pick up uh, chapter 13, verse 1a, and that's the end of that paragraph. And then with verse 1b, then it resumes again, and so right at the point where you want connection to, to bring out the, 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 what the whole point of it is, they <coughs> unfortunately made this, this break. I don't know if other, do other versions do that? Yes, that's yes. generally done. And, and any version that has a little more continuity between uh, all, all of this? In any case, there should be continuity. So now when you come then to the, the, the second part of, uh, of verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, the first, and the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Now then, now yeah, that's Daniel 7, hmm? 1 and 2. I saw the four great winds of, of, of heaven uh, there, representative of, of the old dragon power, 
uh, blowing over the waters of the sea, and uh, here in Revelation uh, 13, it's uh, the dragon himself, and he's on the shore of the sea, and the beast comes out of the sea, obviously at his behest. Hmm? So the dragon is there as, as the pseudo-creator, and he brings forth, the, and he's the one with the seven heads and the, 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 uh, and, uh, the, the ten horns, and uh, therefore what he produces is a kingdom of the dragon, a, and not of the son of man, a kingdom of, of uh, the, the dragon, a beast which had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, uh, and uh, had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. Leopard, bear, lion, the first three beasts of Daniel 7, no doubting the, the connection. But uh, here, all sort of welded together in a representation of the fourth beast. Huh? Here's the, the fourth beast of, of Daniel, now represented as a composite of the, the first uh, three. And uh, the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne, great authority. And then it goes on with uh, something of the history of, of uh, the seven heads that we want to say a little bit more about as we, we come to analyze uh, what, in terms of the book of Revelation, is, uh, is the little horn of, of uh, uh, Daniel 7. But in any case, right now, we're just trying to establish the thesis that we have creation imagery. and. Uh, here, here is uh, Satan's uh, counterfeit uh, 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 creation. So our our, our themes in in, uh, in Revelation 13 are are going to be a, a pseudo creation, uh, and we could have used that same term, I suppose, in Daniel 2. In Daniel 2, we said we started with creation. Well, it was the pseudo creation of, of the image, and then we moved on to decreation and recreation. Well, that's the outline as well here in uh, in Revelation 13. Is a, here's the pseudo creation, the emergence of the four beasts from the sea, and then of course there follows the, the decreation, which is the destruction of, of uh, the beasts, and uh, then there follows the the theme of uh, recreation in the form of uh, the Son of Man and his investment with the kingdom and and uh, the uh, dominion and so forth. So as an outline, uh, maybe if you would, uh, an outline of, of chapter 7, uh, uh, the vision part is uh, verses 1 through 14, and then the interpretation, verses 15 through 28. And uh, within the first 14 verses of the vision, <coughs> verses 1 through 8, verses 1 through 8 are are the counterfeit kingdom, the world kingdom. Verses 9 through 12 then would be uh, the, the judgment of the world of the beast and so on, which is the work of decreation. And then verses 13 and 14 would be, would be the vindication and the inheritance of the saints, or the, the recreation. Verses 13 through 14. And, and then with each of these things, uh, it develops somewhat. You, you have to read the interpretation, uh, too, to fill out the details. For example, the business of uh, the, the key thought of the uh, the beast persecuting the saints actually comes out only in connection with the with the, the interpretation uh, a little later on. on. Well, now let's uh, then uh, look at this beast and and the, the little horns. And uh, on my view, at least, the ten horns are are part of the beast situation right from the outset. And then in the midst of them, there comes forth a little horn. And uh, it starts small, and yet right away it replaces three others. It uproots three of the ten. And before it's done, we get the language that it is more imposing than all the others. So there's something of a, of, of a development uh, that we have here. Similar to what we had in chapter 8, remember in chapter 8 there was also that little horn figure that was associated with, uh, with uh, the figure of the, the, the he-goat, and there it definitely represented Antiochus Epiphanes. And uh, there too the thought was he, he started from small beginnings, and yet before he's done he's exalting himself against the hosts of heaven. And similarly here with the little horn of uh, Daniel 7, the one connected with the fourth beast, he's a little horn. And yet, as I say, there's a development, I think, to an antichrist stage. 
Now, on, on Young's view, the little horn is only the Antichrist, on my view. Uh, it is, the little horn is the, the whole hostile world during the whole age, but including, huh? not excluding, but in, including, recognizing that there is a crisis at the, the, the end of this age, uh, the man of lawlessness uh, thing. And uh, so now our concern is to try to I identify these things. And uh, so the uh, ten horns are the things up until 70, the, the little horn, the, the world power against God and his church ever since, but culminating then in the, the, the figure of the final Antichrist. Now let's try to see what happens to this figure of the little horn in Revelation 12 and 13 again. So we move back to, to that and and uh, the identification of the little horn is uh, certainly the, uh, of Daniel 7 is uh, not with the whole fourth uh, uh, not with the whole beast from the sea huh? and uh, that we just saw in Revelation 13 Satan stands by the sea he calls forth uh, a kingdom in his own uh, uh, image and uh, now this this uh, beast has seven heads and, and ten horns and so we have to go in a little bit to the, the history of those seven heads which are uh, are described both in Revelation 13 and then again in Revelation 17. And the way it works out then, uh, of the seven heads we are told, five are fallen. So here we are right at the beginning of, of the Christian era, John's writing from his first century perspective. And from that perspective, five of the, the seven heads of this beast uh, have al already fallen, which tells us then that uh, that this calling forth of the beast on the part of Satan is not something that has just happened because uh, uh, the, the five uh, heads that are fallen would uh, represent the Old Testament history perhaps corresponding to the, the what's going on under all of the four beasts uh, uh, of uh, Daniel 7. Five are fallen, one now is. And so in John's, uh, here we are in the beginning of the church age, and uh, the sixth head of, of, uh, of the beast of Revelation 13 represents John's current present state of affairs but then of course there's the seventh one that is to come and must remain a little while and then mysteriously we read about the beast himself as, as being an eighth and of the seven and you know I, I think we simply have to see that uh, the, uh, the, the seventh one is the Antichrist stage uh, of uh, the little horn. The little horn starts at the beginning of the church age, goes to the end, and uh, in Revelation 13, the, the seventh head represents the Antichrist stage of, of the little horn, at which point somehow there is a, almost a, a, the picture you get is a, a, of almost an incarnation of the draconic satanic beast himself in uh, the, this uh, representative king. Uh, some such close association of the Antichrist figure with Satan uh, himself, however precisely you want to uh, conceive of that. But the, the, the beast itself, the old uh, Satan dragon himself, comes to his final expression in this seventh uh, head. He has an eighth, eighth one, and yet of, of uh, the seven. So that's uh, the way things are, are, are described. And therefore, if you want to uh, ask you know, what the little horn of Daniel 7 in terms of Revelation 13, I think you have to be precise and say the little horn is represented by the sixth and seventh heads of the beast of, uh, of uh, Revelation uh, 13. Now over in Revelation 17, in connection with the account of the destruction of Babylon, which is one of the interesting symbolic figures and much debated ones in, in the book of Revelation and many understand uh, the, the Babylon figure as a, a symbol for the world culture in general. Uh, world culture in general is over against the, the beast uh, figures which would represent the, 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 the political uh, uh, formation, the kingdom formation of it. But uh, for myself, I, I don't think that does justice to the data in the book of Revelation. I, I think that uh, that the Babylon figure, the harlot, the great city there, is very clearly the, the apostate church. It's the first time it's spoken of, and it's identified as the, in chapter 11 as the 
you know, the great city, which is where the Lord was crucified. Now, that's the covenant uh, community, huh? the apostate covenant community, uh, and not just the world, world culture and, uh, out there in, in general. And uh, so I see the figure of Babylon then as, as it being the New Testament continuation, expansion of, of the harlotry of the, of the old covenant uh, uh, community. But in any case, uh, uh, chapter 17 and so on is, is dealing here now with the mystery of this Babylon the great and, and to uh, interpret it, it relates Babylon to, to the beast and uh, she is seen as riding on the back of, of, of this beast and uh, as you move through the chapter it, it, we read about uh, the mystery of the woman and of the beast that she rides which has the seven heads and ten horns, the beast which you saw once was now is not now, in, in chapter 13, we had the past five heads were and uh, then the present and, and, and future were represented by the, the sixth and, and, and seventh uh, heads, including a, a crisis uh, uh, here. And uh, now we read uh, concerning it that the beast you, uh, you, you were looking at once was. Hmm? And what is interesting, that is, that it goes on to say, and now is not. <coughs> and future will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction, and maybe we could uh, say that's six, and this is seven <coughs> slash eight. The, the beast himself is an eighth one uh, of, of the seven. But now in, in uh, Revelation uh, 17 that we're looking at, the beast was, he is not, but he is to come. So, of course, this is part of all of this counterfeiting. There's not only counterfeit creation, but there's counterfeiting of the names of God. God is the one who is and who was and who is to come. Hmm? And, and, and so the dragon uh, or, or the beast is the one who, who was and now not is, but is not. But nevertheless, he is the one who is to come, but not, not to come as, as the Lord is the one who is to come in judgment to, to establish his eternal kingdom, but rather he's the one who is to, to come to come up in order that he might descend into hell forever and uh, so that's the way, and he will come up out of the abyss and go to his destruction <coughs> Antichrist is the one who aspires to the, to the heights of Armageddon uh, to the Arcte Boar, as it's described, the, the uh, the, the Arche Zaphon, the heights of Zaphon, uh, but instead, Isaiah 14, he actually descends into the Arche de Bor, the, the depths of, of the abyss. And uh, so here, the, the beast power is the one who, in some sense, is presently is not, and yet, in a future crisis, will come up, not, however, to achieve his final victory, but to achieve the final stamping of the serpent's head and to go to his destruction. And uh, now, what is particularly interesting, I think, is, is this way of looking at things in Revelation 17. And then you, you look at the Millennium Passage uh, in, uh, in Revelation uh, 20, and the very popular uh, ob objection, you know, to the, the idea that... Uh, the amillennial or even postmillennial interpretation of the thousand years uh, is that uh, th that is the present that Satan is already bound hmm? the the event uh, that uh, initiates so the, the the thousand years the binding of of, of Satan the the popular objection is uh, how how can that be some how can the millennium be be, be now and, and which would mean that Satan is bound. When, as a matter of fact, he, he's, he's active as all get out all over the place, as we all, all know. And I think what is interesting is that that, that binding uh, of Satan uh, that, that is true now, 
previously, huh? Previously, he was the deceiver of all the nations, huh? But now he's been bound by the strong man, and he's no longer able to deceive all the nations. But the day is coming when he will be unbound, and once again, he will be the deceiver of all the nations. He, together with his beast from the sea and his false prophet beast from the land, pictured as demons in the form of frogs going forth to deceive all the nations of the world once, once again in, in that uh, uh, future crisis, only, of course, to be thrown into the, uh, the, the pit. So, so that there are uh, these similarities. But this is the thing that I think is interesting. Huh? Uh, how can Satan be described as being bound when he is doing uh, all kinds of mischief, persecuting the saints? Well, this could ask the same question here. How, how can Revelation 17 say that during the time when the beast is active as the sixth head, that he is not clearly, there are two different ways of, of, of looking at the thing. In, in one sense, in one sense, that the beast is active. Eh? It, it exists. It exists in, in the world as, as a, a hateful uh, power represented by the sixth head to be intensified as the seventh head. And yet, from some point of view, it is not. So whatever, whatever it is that, that uh, Revelation 17 says about the, the, uh, the beast during this present time, you, everyone, has to deal with. Hmm? And if it can say that uh, the sixth head nevertheless is negated and it is not, and then very readily we can say that Satan during the same period is bound, even though he threw that sixth head is uh, doing this, that, and, and the, the other th uh, thing. Well, so in, in terms of, of this now, our, our little horn of Daniel 7 should be identified as uh, the beast of Revelation 13 and 17 in terms of its sixth and its uh, seventh uh, heads. And uh, well, we'll have to take it from there tomorrow, I guess. Next hour, I'll get those uh, papers up in your boxes if you're still around. Yeah.